Jesus shows up, things get better. Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. And he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee thou shalt, shouldn't not eat? I want you to notice there, it was no surprise to God their condition. He knew who they were before. What changed was their self-awareness of their condition. Now, flip over in your Bibles. I'm going to try to do this quickly. First Timothy. Everybody say First Timothy. Chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. The Bible says, I charge, I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee. Now, he's saying dwell on those prophecies, those things that have been said on they haven't happened yet. Own you means it's it's recorded to your name, but it hasn't happened yet. But think on those things, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Any, anybody here at war? A anybody here besides me under attack? Anybody here have uh, uh, thinking that brings you down? Anybody got people that bring? Anybody got? I thought I was talking to real people in here today. Next verse, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made, everybody say shipwreck. I'm here to preach a very simple thought today. Who told you? Who told you? Jesus, and on our ears to hear. God, bring your word alive and make it powerful and active and help us today to be able to ask who told us and let us only hear your word in our lives today. And everybody say, in Jesus' name. Now, I've asked Brother Brian to help me with something. Are you good, Brother Brian? Now, if, if you're not from Pentecost background, this is going to mess you up. But I believe... Oftentimes, the music, that's why we have worship. Anybody here got had a week this week? Anybody got stuff facing you this week? But we, we come and we have our hearts and minds recalibrated by the worship word set to music, and it kind of lifts our mood. But I've asked Brother Brian, we're going to do something very spiritual here. We're going to meet and greet, okay? And he's going to play a song, and if you want to meet and greet and sing, it'll be okay. Is all right? Now, if you don't want to meet and greet, just you can take your seat. Nobody's going to bother you. But there is something about when the church gets out of their comfort zone and begins to greet one another, God begins to move in our midst. Amen? Brother Brian, go ahead and start it. Cut that up.
Come on, give God a hand clap of praise today. Amen. Amen. They're going to keep going anyway. Amen. You may be seated. I feel better already, don't you? Amen. God asked the first family a question. The question that he asked them, he says, who told you you were naked? Notice they had disobeyed, and in their disobedience, they went and hid themselves. Can I, can I tell you, pastor usually knows when he does a home visit, when people don't want to come to the house of the Lord, there's usually something they're hiding from. Hmm. I, I shared with one of my pastor friends at camp meeting, he says, what do you attribute some of the success of your growth in Smyrna? I said, it's because I started out day one with a butterfly net in one hand and a stun gun in the other. <laughs> We're going to come looking for you if you come up missing, okay? And he laughed, and I said, I don't know why you're laughing. Now, you got some people in Smyrna. You can come see the marks on them where they got burns. And he laughed, and I'm laughing today. The natural tendency when emotion overwhelms us is to retreat and fortify ourselves uh, and escape and try to survive the moment and try to live through the emotion. The reality here is that God put in us a brain. He was extra good to some of you. God also put in man the ability to imagine. And the imagination, God through his systems created all that we have. He created a lighting system and a water system. And he created the ecosystem as we know it. And that's how we live. But God doesn't come back every Monday creating more people. He created the reproductive system. And the natural order of things is that God set it up. But then he gave us an imagination. And that means if we need a coffee table, God doesn't show up and create a coffee table. He created trees, but he gave us imagination that from what he's already created, we can take what we have and we can contrast it to what we need. And then we can take what God has already provided and make it make a coffee table or meet our immediate need. I, I'm going somewhere. Stay with me for just a minute. But is it not ironic that God who put so much in man left out a conscience? But he loaded it inside the fruit of a tree of knowledge of good and evil. In other words, you need imagination more than you need a conscience. Oh, y'all look really scared today. The relevant point was. Our conscience is the origin of our emotions. Be, that's how we feel. That's how we uh, have a uh, predisposition to like and dislike. And God wanted us to have a, an imagination to exist in his garden of paradise and use the imagination to, to expand or, in human terms, create. The, re the problem with having a conscience is we realize how limited we are. Can I give you a word today? But God knew before you ever had a revelation how limited you are. For the Bible says he created angels first. But his second creation of worship was humanity. And Hebrews tells us we're created lower than the angels. If the angels are not equal to God, we better know for sure we're not equal equal to God. Yet, God created us as inferior to him, but he loved us as we are. The problem with the conscience is it changed our feelings about our circumstance. Beforehand, they didn't have no clothes and they didn't care. 
I, I, I think the garden's coming back. It's at Walmart. Because there's people ain't got much on and they don't seem to care. I, I, felt, I, I felt something just sweep through here on that. But let's be honest for a minute. Our feelings get us in trouble. It is through the emotion of lust that many are led astray. It is through the emotion of anger that people go way too far. Jails and prisons are full of people that didn't plan on being there, but anger took them to a place they never thought they would go. The emotion of pride causes us to be elevated of our superiority and how awesome we are, and it leads to a fall and destruction. But there's also the emotions of fear. Notice that after they ate forbidden fruit, now they have a conscience. It's now in them part of who they are. Their response to the same God that they had walked in fellowship with is to run and hide from him. I literally believe that God withheld the conscience from man because he knew if we ever had conscience or were governed by our feelings, it would interrupt our relationship with him. He wants to be close to you. He knew you were inferior when he came in the garden before you had a conscience. And you're inferior after the fall. But guess what? God still loves you. Feelings of inadequacy. Feelings of unworthiness. I cannot tell you the people that struggle with emotional feelings of I'm not worthy. I'm inadequate. How could ever a God who is good love me who is awful? And there's been people that have come and set service after service and they make no move towards God because they've convinced themselves by an emotional estate that God could never accept them. I've wanted to say if you don't believe God can or God will, why do you come? But I'm not going to run them off because as long as they're coming to the house of the Lord, there is a chance that the mercy of God will poke a hole in the darkness that corrupts their thinking. Maybe the light bulb will go off one day. I'm not very much, but he, to me, he's become everything. With him, all things are possible. So keep coming. God created in us reason, logic, imagination. But the, con the conscience gives us so many side effects, so many feelings that distract us. And I want you to know our enemy, the devil, knows how to dial in to our Feelings. See, God put conscience in the forbidden fruit to indicate disobedience. He knew they had eaten. Now, God is omniscient. He knows all. But it was validated by how they responded to his presence. He knew by how they responded to him. I read, a, I read quite a bit of stuff of history, especially uh, the wars, the major wars, especially World War II and the Civil War. And Brother Walden, I read uh, a new, uh, an article recently how a whole group of American allied forces surrendered. They were in an advantageous position. They had the high ground. They had unlimited supplies. They had air support. But the enemy who was nearby hacked into their weather radio frequency and begin to expand propaganda to them that you are surrounded and your generals have already surrendered and your wives at home have been un faithful and your kids are not going to recognize you and we're going to annihilate you 
unless you surrender, lay down your weapons. And over 150 men who had a superior position laid their weapons down and went and surrendered. Why would they do that? I want you to know because our enemy is just like that enemy. He'll get on your frequency and at a low place of isolation in the midst of the battle, he'll start playing on your feelings and tell you you're no good and you're not worthy and God has forgotten you. I'm here to tell you something. God knows right where you're at. He knows what you're going through and I'm not going to let him dominate me by my feelings because there's something greater than how I feel and that is God. God. God said I could be perfect no matter how I feel. I didn't need a conscience. I can have relationship with God without a conscience. Here's what I want you to hear today. I can't understand how that could be, Pastor. I was about nine years old. We had just finished one of our famous Saddler Saturday morning breakfast. That's where mom and dad would get up and fry sausage and ham and bacon. Crumble that bacon back, excuse me, crumble that sausage back up in that grease and make gravy and have biscuits and eggs any way you want them. And I'm getting hungry, brother. I'll fry back. You can't sleep when that goodness fills the house and my brother and I would get up and rub our eyes and <clears throat> make our way to the table and we would eat and talk and hear about everybody's week and laugh and reminisce and get biblical concepts. But when enough was enough, Dad said, well, I, I got some new hedge clippers. I, I need to go trim the shrubs. Your mom's been on me. So I'm going to get those new hedge clippers out. And so uh, my brother, who is fascinated by uh, machinery, always has been, he said, can I help you? My brother's about 11. Can I help you? And dad said, yeah, I guess you can. And I kind of looked and he says, I'm a little concerned you're nine years old. You might be a little too small, but it's a two-man job. But if we need you, we'll call you. Oftentimes, my biggest contribution to family projects was staying out of the way. So I, I had an affinity towards uh, sports and activities like that. And so I got my basketball and I went out on the patio and I began to shoot baskets. And these two big boys in our neighborhood kind of wandered by and saw me shooting. And they said, can we, can we shoot too? I said, I guess so. And they got up there and they're bigger than me. And they started rebounding the ball and passing it to each other. And before long, they were in a heated game of 21. And I began to realize by their actions, I was just in the way. I wasn't in the game. I was just in the way. And finally, one of the boys says, hey, you're in the way. Get out of here. We're playing a game here. So I went back in the garage, put my little chin, rested on my hands, my head looking down to the ground. I was having a pity party. My ball, my goal, my house, and I can't play. About that time, my dad, who had been preparing for battle with the hedges, and he had work clothes on and long sleeves and work boots and a big hat, he came and said, he could hear the basketball bouncing off the goal on the side of the house, but what are you doing in here? And who's playing basketball? And I said, Dad, they told me I couldn't play. He said, who told you? Can I repeat that? My daddy said, who told you you could not play? I said, them two big old boys. Now, you got to remember, they were only 11 and 12, but when you're nine, they're big old boys. Dad looked out the door of the garage and sized up the situation. Can I tell you the truth? I really thought my dad was going to tell me, get out of here. This is my yard. It's my boy's goal, my boy's ball. Get out of here. But my daddy didn't do that. After sizing them up, I was amazed. He turned the bill of his hat up. He untucked his shirt. He wedged his long britches into the tops of his boots. 
and said, do you boys want to play two on two? Now, can I say my dad was not known as an athlete. But full-grown man and 12-year-old boys, you don't have to be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You don't have to be Kobe Bryant. So after they said, yes, I, I went out there. And do you know what? Within just a few minutes of my dad blocking their ever shot and making easy layups, they got discouraged and just left. And I can still see my dad, Sister Diane, with that ball under his arm, hat turned up, shoes tucked in his boots. He said, I guess we won then, didn't we? I, I don't know if you're going to get this or not. God could have told the devil, scram. But he didn't. <laughs> but what he did do was begin to change his appearance. He who was God robed himself in flesh. And dwelt among us. He came and said, hey, let's be on the same team. He did all the work. But then he said, we won. I don't think you're getting it today. I'm here to tell you. You may not like what you're going through and it may not feel good to you. But we got a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. For God robed himself in flesh and said, if you will identify with me, I will stop with you. The Bible says he won the victory. He descended into hell, led captivity captive, gave gifts to men. He ascended up in glory and he came back and you got Christ in you, the hope of glory to empower you. My Bible says we're no longer prisoners. We're no longer sufferers. We're no longer bond to sin. But we've been set free by the blood of the Lamb. You're a co-heir with Jesus Christ. He did the work, but you reap the benefits. I'm here to tell you, quit listening to those who say you can't. With God, all things are possible. If he says you've been freed, you are free. If he says you've been cleansed, you've been cleansed. I don't care what it looks like. Go trying to hold it together. Stay with me. You want to know who says I can be free? The blood says I can be free. You want to know who says I can come out of depression? The blood says I can come out of depression. You want to know who says I can come out of addiction? The blood says I Here's the problem. First Timothy tells us there are those that start out with faith and a good conscience. Notice Faith precedes the conscience. Your conscience will fail you, but faith will sustain you. He says, but there are those who started, who became shipwrecked because they let their conscience supersede their faith. But you better let your faith supersede. I can tell you this, you can take a child that you've never met before and you can take a set of parents who, who've never parented before, but they can come before a judge and there's a legal transaction. It's called adoption. You might have met for the first time in the courtroom. You might be strangers, but under the legal term of adoption, when you leave that courtroom, they're your child. I don't think you're getting this today. That's why the Bible says you are redeemed. That word redemption is a legal term. It means you didn't have a blood claim to it. But a judge declared. I don't care how you feel about it today. If God says he's forgiven you. He's forgiven you. I don't care how you feel. That's why the Bible says we have been adopted into the body of Christ. Have I got three more minutes? I 
almost never do this. I'm going to get you a scripture. Next to the last book of the Bible, one chapter, Jude. The Beatles messed him up for a lot of people. I'm going to tell you. But verse 3 of Jude. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware who were before old ordained of this condemnation and godly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God. Woo! For the awful word to run it that way. The only Lord God. He's not one of many or one of three. He's the one and only. And our Lord Jesus Christ. I will put the... But therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. I don't have time to preach all that. That's what I want you to get. Jude is telling the church in succinct fashion. He said, you know the children of Israel who was in Egypt's bondage? That God said, if you'll... Take an innocent set-apart lamb and sacrifice it and drain its blood and apply it to the door. That when the death angel comes over, what brings death to those of Egypt will bring deliverance to the people of... It took faith to apply the blood. It cost them something. Can I go on record and say this? Notice they didn't apply the blood on the inside where nobody could see. They had to apply the blood on the outside where they had to publicly identify with this doctrine. And I'm going to tell you, if you're ever going to come out of this world, you got to publicly identify with Jesus Christ. If you're ashamed of Him, and God worked in a miraculous fashion and brought them out, 2.5 million people. He didn't give them an army. He gave them the blood. And the blood set them free. And by faith they walked out of a land of bondage all they had ever known. But God let the same people that he delivered by the blood die because they lost their faith in the blood. Don't let your conscience, don't let how you feel about certain things lead you astray and destroy you and corrupt the salvation He loved you while you were yet sinners. Brother Dallas, it was nothing good we did. It was the good that Jesus did. It's by grace, through faith. I'm telling you, they're not going to talk me out of it. The Bible says when they decided that bacon was okay to eat, and they said, we can't eat that because it's unclean. The Spirit of God said, what I've called clean, let no man call unclean. You better get a revelation of this today. They may look at you and remind you of what you've done and where you've been and how you messed up. But God ain't looking at your past. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. He didn't come to you because you're good. He came to you because He loves you. And if we ever make it more or less than that, we've missed it. I got to have faith and a good conscience. That's why these signs shall follow them that believe. We're not saved by them. It's the result of us being saved. Now I can hear the wheels turning in certain people's minds. Are you saying it's okay to live in sin? And tell yourself you're saved. Paul said it so well. He said, God forbid. The text I read you today that we should not dwell in sin. That there are people and preachers that will tell you, you can live any old way, go any old way, and do any old thing and be saved. The revelation that I have is this. You can have been anywhere and done anything, 
But after you have that encounter and you have a reconciliation, you were a lost orphan, but God said, I'm going to make you in a family, the family of God. I'm going to give you brothers and sisters. You're not going to be a wicked stepchild. You're... There's no big eyes or little U's. Uh, everything the Father has is divided evenly among His children because we're all engrafted by the blood What I want you to get today, if you don't hear anything else, I'll say, quit letting how you feel tell you who you are. I'm so glad it's not based on a feeling, but it's based on a heavenly fact. When your name's written in the Lamb's book of life, when it's covered by the blood, God is on his throne. I'm not preaching easy believism, but I'm going to tell you this. It's hard to walk the straight and narrow when you got the weight of sin weighing you down. God has come to set us free from the weight of sin that we're able. Chris, come help me preach. Come on. Who loves Chris? Come here. You're going to help me preach, ain't you? Boy, he looks nervous, and I'm loving every minute of it. Okay. Okay. Now, put I didn't tell you to move. Simon didn't say move. Yeah, that's right. I didn't say tenfold. That's right. Okay. Put your blinders on. Yeah. Okay. Who in here admits we let emotions get us distracted? How I feel. How I feel. There's some Sundays, even though I'm on the preaching schedule, I don't feel like coming. Sometimes I don't feel like answering my phone. You know, caller ID is good and it's bad. He's got his blinders on. Okay. Okay. Imagine he's got his ears stuffed full of cotton. Okay. Now, if the weight of sin's weighing you down, look down. No, 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 no. Don't get down. Look down. Look down. <clears throat> now, it, is he going to be able to follow direction? Remember, he's got cotton in his ears. Jesus come to lift the weight of sin. Where we can look unto Jesus. The, keep, the Bible says, keep looking up for your redemption draweth nigh. You can't be under the weight of sin. Now watch this. He can make it through the worst obstacle course because he's looking unto Jesus, the author. And I'm telling somebody today under the unction of the Holy Ghost, don't let your feelings weigh you down. Don't let the enemy distract you. Don't let him get on your frequency and tell you where you've been and what you've done. You look unto Jesus. It's more than a feeling. Who told you you can't come out of depression? Who told you you can't be delivered? Who told you your finances can't turn around? Who told you you can't receive the whole? That's not my God. See, God knew who they were before, but he also had a plan for after the fact that he could reconcile you unto himself. That's another legal term. Come on, stand to your feet. That's another legal term, Brother Brian. Reconciliation is a legal term. I don't want nobody raising their hand. But have you ever heard of somebody being bankrupt? That's a legal term, Alexander, bankrupt. Sometimes we declare ourselves bankrupt when we're really not bankrupt. We're just overwhelmed. But there's a legal exception that if you can show the potential of earnings versus the amount of debt, if it's determined within a working life, depending on your age, but usually it's a 30-year metric, if your debt far exceeds what you could earn in a working lifetime, a judge who knows you owe it, but because we've developed mercy in our court system, he can sign his name and smite that gavel down. You go in there and you owe more than you could ever owe, but you walk out debt free. 
Now, here, here's the point. The point is, who in here has ever been spiritually and morally bankrupt? Gone too far, done too much? But let me tell you what. There's a righteous judge. Yeah. His name is Jesus. And I don't care how you feel about it. My Bible says he came and bled and died on a cross to reconcile the world. You in the world today? He came to reconcile whosoever will. Do you have a desire today? He signs his name. Big J-E-S-U-S. Underlines it. He brings that gavel down. Whom he says is free is free indeed. But if we're not careful, we let the thoughts of those creditors and the thoughts of those circumstances try to lie to us and tell us what the righteous judge said is not true. I'm here to tell you, if he set you free, you're free indeed. If he says you're delivered, you're delivered completely. If he says you're forgiven, it's absolutely forgiven. And to be remembered, no. Sister Beth's going to play something. I'm asking a question today. Who's been telling you that your best days are behind you? Who's been telling you that you can't be saved? It's not my God. My God tells us that the prophet makes room for his prophecies. There's multiple interpretations on that. But I'm here to tell you, I don't think you can prophesy something that God is not able to complete. I'm not talking about prosperity doctrine. But I'm talking about if you'll be crazy enough to believe that God is able to deliver you, guess what? God will show up and deliver you because He's moved not by your perfection, but by your faith in what He can do. You got lost loved ones? If you could just snap your fingers, you would see him saved and it doesn't seem like it's changing the Bible's very clear that it's by the prayer of the saints the father was in the home still praying and looking for his son to come to him she's best going to sing his chorus today but who's been telling you what's possible and what's not possible today with God all things are possible If you've got a petition, if you've got a situation, if you've been in a low place, if you have struggled with how you feel about certain things, God is going to be able today, if you'll trust Him in faith, to take away every fear, every doubt, every anxiety. Who in here needs God to give you an assurance? As they've seen today, this altar is open. Come and pray.